Hello, everyone. It is Thursday. <laughs> I forgot what day it is. And there's my guest coming on board. Very good. Perfect timing. It's like the world just collided at the right time. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's Thursday. This is another edition of the MSP Initiative Live. We uh, we have a special guest today, uh, JP from F1 Technologies out of uh, the great state of Texas down in Fort Worth. And um, actually, we'll, we'll start on this. JP, a huge thank you to you and your team for uh, for hosting us for Channel Strong. Uh, this is the second time you've, you've actually given us some some love. So like double the thanks. We're going to have to hook you up. But uh, for anyone who doesn't know what Channel Strong is, um, it's a series of outside style tailgate MSP meetups, if you would. It's probably the best um, description. Uh, as well as some lunch and learn. So if you want to learn more about that, um, we're four days into our schedule, Houston, Texas today, but we have a long road ahead of us. You can see the rest of the dates here going into next Friday. Uh, if you're in one of these areas or close by, you can jump in a car, join us. It's free, totally free, and grab a beer and hang out. So we have both, uh, th these are in the evenings, four to six, and then we have lunch and learns that are midday if you're more of a you know, lunch per, uh, crowd. So um, head to mspinitiative.com, sign up. Again, totally free. Actually, you're going to walk away with more than you walked in with. That much I can tell you. Amen. Also, a reminder for everyone who probably doesn't realize, we gather a group of very friendly vendors together and we do monthly giveaways, right? So um, again, all you know, if you don't enter, you can't win. It's like the lottery. So uh, head over here, hit giveaways, put your name in. You got 10 chances to win this month. I mean, everything from gift cards to beer to all sorts of good stuff. So um, those three ch Channel Strong Lunch and Learns giveaways, I, I don't know how much more free stuff I can give you, but if I can come up with something, we'll let you know. Anyway, back, back to the jam. JP, welcome today. How are you, friend? Thanks. Thanks. You're doing well, man. Yeah. We love having you guys. Having you guys. For sure. It was, it was a great time. Yeah, I mean, it was great weather. Uh, we just missed a little bit of rain coming through the state of Texas, I think. A little rain, a little wind. We did. But we actually had great weather at your place. Great, um, you know, we had a, a great barbecue joint, too, that actually helped us with um, burgers and snacks and cookies and all sorts of stuff. So that Thank guy you. was uh, that guy was fantastic. Thanks. Thanks. Good, good guy. Yeah, fantastic. So, so. I want to get a couple of things out of the way for, for everyone who doesn't know. Um, first, uh, as everyone pr who follows me knows, um, you know, Chick-fil-A is, is a regular part of my diet. <laughs> Turns out JP may not be at the level of, uh, of, of uh, points in the bank that I have, but he's not far behind. Apparently you're a big Chick-fil-A guy too. Big time. The whole family is, the whole gang here is. Too, too funny. Too, too, too funny. And uh, you're at signature status too, right? I am. So like we're we're in, we're an exclusive club. Um, I don't know if you um, noticed, but I, I didn't realize it when we got in that they they start they handing start extra little things, little gift, gift cards, cards inside of the bag whenever you go through drive through or something, or something to go or whatnot. What. Yeah, no, I definitely have uh, have seen that. And you know, listen, I'm at. Uh, I think I, I told my I told everyone I'm shooting for ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine points before I start using my. Uh, <laughs> my rewards. I want to see what happens if the screen expands and if I get to hundred thousand. You out, so make you use your points. I, I will see. Yeah, like they're starting to like kind of bump up, right? When I go to it and I like pick pick a sandwich, you're like, do you want to use your points? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna eat free for a year one time, so uh, so all good. And then, why don't you explain to the audience what the difference is between regular ice and Sonic ice? <laughs> so I don't know if Sonic's everywhere else. Uh, you know, I'm sure it is, but Sonic is the little bitty pieces of of chipped ice, I guess is what you might call it. But they're real tiny, and in just I guess it's a a science thing you know the more surface you have to a to an ice cube the colder you can make the fluid in it so it gets colder i think it does water down a little more so you have to drink things a little quicker uh but most people like it because they can chew on it and it may not be the best thing for you but uh they love chewing on it interesting yeah. okay it's really to easy to chew on 
it's good to know. So yeah, you have you have a cool little Sonic Ice machine. We do uh, that. Apparently, is uh, not exactly the cheapest thing on the planet, but for people who like, it's the same ice Chick Fil A uses. I mean, so for the Chick Fil Aers out there. You know, you like that ice they have? That's, I guess, Sonic ice. Uh, so check it out. Yes, our, our friend Paul from Compliance Group said he bought a smaller version of what you have at your office. And it was like $400 for his kitchen. I said, it's a pretty expensive ice machine for your kitchen, man. But hey, to each their own. <laughs> uh, all right. Take it on the camper with you. Yeah, no, fit right on. Or, or an RV tour bus, right? Or an RV. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then the other thing was um, you actually have a pretty cool space. Like you Thanks. actually like, you know, modernized it and you made it kind of like, I'm not saying you have a slide down like the, the roof, like, you know, the, all these guys do to their office, but it's yeah. actually a pretty, pretty, pretty sweet space. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. It's an old converted. Uh, oh gosh. Uh, I've just lost my train of thought on uh, the Freemasons. It's an old Freemasons building from the, the late thirties, early forties that, uh, that they used. Uh, they converted it to a church, a church bought them out in the, the early eighties and, worked in that until the early uh, 2000s and then the uh, the gentleman who bought it now which is uh, which is a pretty good guy and wanted us in kind of as an anchor client but he turned it all into similar to a co-working space kind of like works or something and uh, well, what's really cool is he came in and gutted the whole thing so the boards of the roof the old wood is from the 40s the brick is from the the uh, 40s and he left that but put a whole lot of modern touch to it or his his wife did actually uh, but some pretty cool, pretty cool things in there. The the bathroom is the one that catches most people's eyes. It's a real bright orange, and there's arrows that point to the men's and the women's room. It says "men to the left" because the women are always right. And so, <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Um, so, what, you know, for anyone who has never had the opportunity or or pl- privilege, in my opinion, to have run into you at some point and just talk shop in the middle of the hallway, parking lot, wherever. Uh, why don't you give everybody a little bit of background on you, how you started your business, what it looks like today, you know, kind sure. of. Blah, blah. So I got lucky enough to get started by my seventh grade teacher in the, uh, in, in the uh, early eighties, we'll call it um, where we got started Commodore, or not Commodore 64s, uh, the TRS eighties. She bought two of them. Uh, she couldn't talk the administration into getting two floppy drives. So my dad and I went down to the local radio shack. We got all the hardware and we ended up hooking things up so that all we had to do was flip a switch instead of unplugging to load our program and, and doing that whole deal. Um, and I was hooked after that. My dad was a big techie. Um, anyway, he was a big chess player. He uh, was one of the folks that helped in. It was instrumental in the three-dimensional chessboard that Spock and, and um, uh, Captain Kirk would play all the time. He's got a, a newspaper clipping. So anyway, techie geek. Uh, so I kind of grew up with it. He passed away when I was really young. And so my mom's side of the family had a, um, was very large and they were all in the trades industry. They owned plumbing companies, AC companies, all that stuff. So I was the nerd and the geek in the late eighties that got to play around with things before DOS was there. Um, did some minor uh, unethical hacking back in the uh, the eighties of of some things uh, using Commodore sixty fours and uh, some stuff. And uh, anyway, so from there, um, I just that's kind of where I I grew into it. And then I met my wife. We got married. She's a pharmacist. I was a butcher at the time, um, of all things. Um, and we had three kids. And it was it was better for me to stay at home and watch the kids because of the uh, undiagnosed ADHD that I have. And just being a big kid that I am get super excited about all kinds of things. Um, and at the end of that two year stint of, of the daddy daycare, I had taking care of my three, my brother-in-law's three, my other brother-in-law's four. So 10 kids for two years from six in the morning until six in the evening. It was a black, it was the best time. And I will tell you, I, I, I will stop and tell a small testimony here that there is a reason God gave women the nourishing powers that he did, because that is absolutely the hardest job I have ever done in my entire life. Wow. Staying home and taking care of a house and, and kids and family and stuff like that is, is definitely uh, a God for sure. But at the end of that, I got a bunch of acronyms after my name from certifications, the MCSC, the, you know, Nobel stuff, the Cisco stuff and all that kind of stuff. And I sat down at my very first test and I said, all right, I don't normally pray a lot for, myself, but I'm going to ask for some 
uh, some guidance here. And sure enough, I made the only 100 out of 90 folks on my networking plus uh, at the time. Uh, and I said, all right, this is where this is where I'm working is in this industry. And immediately went to work where I met my business partner, to Matt Bates. And um, we were working at a consulting firm that was um, just getting into the break fix. This was in late 97, 98 ish around there. They were mostly programmers for a uh, using thoroughbred uh, programming to do accounting systems. And they were just getting into the break fix business and they lost two of their main contracts and had to shut down after about a year and a half ish. Uh, and so the owner let us out of our non competes. Uh, Matt bought out, um, I think, three, five clients, client partners at the time uh, that weren't doing much, mostly break fix stuff and gave me the ability to go to uh, to another client that they had and we kind of said, hey, we got to have a salary. So how about we just do everything you need, you know, because you're not going to hire us, but we'll do it all for this price. So we kind of started our own retainer thing. Um, I had one client, he had five, I think it was, and we just kept helping each other. He would need to go out with his girlfriend. I'd want to go do something with the family. And we just kept going in and helping each other out, you know, as each other's business. And then finally, I kept nagging. I said, look, let's put this thing together. And, you know, we're, you're, you're an introvert. I'm not. And uh, so why don't we put it together and see if we can't give some people some jobs and let them break into this business? Because it's kind of hard to get into, honestly, without the experience. And then let's use that to help small and businesses grow what we're doing, you know. So finally, in 2002, he had a client that did um, like disc test or the, the Briggs test. Or I can't remember the different ones that are out there, but uh, kind of the the. Um, aptitude, personality testing that, that they had. And he said, well, let's go do this. And if it says that we're compatible to, you know, to start a business together, then, then we'll do it. And so we didn't realize it, but it was like 300 questions. It took us about three and a half hours to do. Came back a couple of days later, the lady is sitting there, you know, the assessor's going through the, the, uh, the, uh, the test and she's shaking her head. They just no. And she, and I could see Matt, setting up in his chair and his uh his shoulders are going up because she's sitting there shaking her head no she goes you two are just complete opposites matt you're an introvert jp you're way over extroverted said but everywhere that there is a kpi for business you guys are off the charts we wouldn't normally say this but you guys really should start a business together wow and so in two you know i could see his shoulders drop a little bit and he looked at me and said all right let's do this so we dissolved our companies and we formed F1 Information Technology in 2003. We had a dozen clients less. We were making them $250,000 a year on mostly, you know, retainer. We called them retainers back then. And, um, golly, referral only. We have done, done no marketing, nothing. Referral only. We've grown to almost $3 million and there's 18 of us. So that's us. That's, and that's a success that, story in my book. I appreciate it. You know, and, and we do what most MSPs do. You know, we are, we do primarily flat rate stuff. We have, and we're very choosy on some of our time and material stuff, but it's mostly flat rate monthly stuff on per user. And I'm an open book. Anybody that knows me out there knows how open book I am. Um, I love to mentor too. And I love getting mentored too as well. Um, so yeah, that's us. No, that's fantastic. That's a Great story, by the way. But, you know, listen, it, it echoes the industry, right? You know, you kind of started out of the, you know, the living room, basement, trunk of your car, and you, yeah. you, know, you know, had to like kind of rub two sticks together in the beginning and make it work, right? And it also echoes the, hey, you know, I, I was in the internal IT the you know realm, and then all of a sudden I fell out, and then I decided to start something. And they are two different animals, although there's a lot of overlap and synergy, right? They're, it's a different... Yes. It's a different walk of life, if you would. So, uh, and that's why we constantly at the lower echelons is the best, prettiest way to say it of MSP world is why there's a constant rotating door, right? You see guys pop up, you see guys go out and like there's a little bit of flux always happening regardless of what, you know, what the situation is. Um, and you brought up a point and actually you mentioned it uh, at Channel Strong. You mentioned it again here today. It's interesting because when you say, hey, you know, I like mentoring guys on the up coming up and I like people who are bigger than me, giving me, you know, ideas and, and tips and, and the road to drive down rather than having to learn it the hard way. 
which is kind of counter to what I've been saying for years is, you know, castle mentality, right? Like everyone thinks right. everybody's their competition and they start digging the moat. It's like day one, right? The building's not even up yet. The alligators in the water coming in. So like, how do you break that? How do you get people to break out of that? Because I agree with you that there's plenty of, bit, you know, like the mindset is there's plenty of business out there for everyone. That's a true story. I, I, I fully believe that. So with that in mind, like you've probably run against people in both pools of thought, right? The, hey, psh, back up. Don't talk to me. Don't come near me. Yep. And then there's other people who are like, hey, man, I'm, how, how do you get where you got? Give me some idea of where I should go, right? How, how, do, you, how do you work on each side of that, of that railroad track? Well, let, let me back up a little bit and kind of explain why I, I love the mentoring ship piece of it from sure. both, both angles. You know, Matt and I were not very good stewards of our company early on. And it, and it showed, you know, five, six years into it, you know, we thought we were doing great. You know, we were doing over a million dollars and, you know, just within, you know, a couple of three years. And then all of a sudden we start going, why, why can't we make these bills? You know, what's going on? We're not running anything personally through our business. We better than to do that. Um, and we're 50, 50, you know, so what's going on? You know, we love what we do. You know, we would, that's the problem. We would almost do it for free. So we weren't billing right. We weren't doing a lot of things right. So one of the things that we did was uh, we had a client partner um, that ended up um, letting us barter some stuff out with him. And, and they did um, they did business coaching, I guess, is the best way to, to do it. They, they did a lot. So we went to several, we went through a two-year course with them. And at the course, it was, it, it stuck with me and still sticks to me. And he said, now, you know, we're in a group of seven um, and it was, it was very religious based. So it was like a C12 type of, of, of uh, business coaching. And he said, look, everybody needs to find a, a, uh, a competitor or a peer, if you want to call them peers, that's why I call them peers, a competitor that uh, is smaller than you, doesn't have to be in the same market, but find one and ask them if you can mentor to them. Just be bold about it. Just like you would ask for a sale, be very bold. Say, hey, I'd like to mentor you and help you with whatever you're doing. And I took it to heart and didn't realize until after several months later when I did that, and we know one of the guys that I did that with, Mark Menzies, um, I, you know, I met him at an exchange conference and I, and I told him, I said, hey man, you know, you, you're, you are eager, man. You are a good, good, good kid. I wouldn't call him a kid now, but um I said, I'd love to mentor to you and just kind of tell you what I know. That's, that's all I said to him. He said, man, this is great. I love this. My parents always told me to find a mentor, yada, yada. And I just started just completely opening up to him. And that's what taught me several things. It's, this is not secret sauce, really. None of what we do is secret sauce. And the more you give, the more you will get back. And that's in everything you do, whether it's what we're doing here, like what you guys are doing with the initiative, or us just opening up and talking about numbers and everything. We we are an open it's like an informal peer group. <laughs> it's exactly it's exactly what it is, you know. And 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 sometimes you laugh and sometimes you cry. And so um, so we took it to heart and we and we did that. And and by doing that, we we accomplished a few things. One that I'll I'll never forget is is that it really made us be better stewards of our own company, realizing hey, we know to do this. We we're not doing it, but we knew we needed to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it helped us hold ourselves accountable uh, big time. Um, and and uh, the second thing was, is that there are certain folks that start a, a business that started out of, and I think I've, I've mentioned this to you before, like what Simon Sinek says is that they're, they have a, a entrepreneurial seizure and they think as a tech that they're gonna go out and they're gonna be able to do this and make all this money but they don't realize what it takes to actually scale a company. What's yep. going to happen when you get extremely busy? You need to be able to quickly shift, uh, make some of those decisions that need to be made, take some very high risks and not be afraid to fail and then get back up and pick all the business stuff that we've all heard and read about books and stuff. Um, and that those people that didn't, if you've, if you've done a good job at befriending them and giving them everything that they need to make themselves successful, they're going to want to be a part of your team when they realize that that's not what they really want to do. They want to be a part of a team and not try to build the team themselves. Those two big things right there has helped us. And we've been able to acquire a couple of companies and, and bring those, those folks on board. And it's been, it's been great. It's been really good. That's so awesome. 
Did I answer your question? No, I yeah. I kind of get on it sometimes. No, 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 you did. I mean, so, you know, it, it's real interesting, like, because, you know, it's, al it's almost like you hear, it's like, hey, you know, you're a teenager, you know everything, right? And it's like, yeah. well, no, you don't, right? Like, you know, when you're on the, when you're on the, you know, the come up, they say, right? I mean, you know, like it's hard work, right? And you don't always know everything that's going on. And you start to, you know, realize that, you know, you know, the stuff that you're doing, you know, like it's about, a lot of it's about the people, right? The people, the process, right? The personalities. Yeah. I mean, the technology, right? Which we're going to get into in a second. Everybody has access to it now. I would argue that in 2021, it's easier to start an MSP than in 2001, than in 1991. Like, yeah. you know, like 20 years, 30 years down the line, half the stuff that we needed to be successful didn't even exist. Exactly. You know, now exactly. you can, you literally don't need to worry about putting servers in Iraq. You don't need to worry about acquiring a lot of equipment. Like it's all subscription based. Now you start pressing buttons and all of a sudden you're online and there's not a lot like, yes, there's still the people cost, right? Like you can't yeah. do that. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have tried, right? We've tried outsourcing, we've tried insourcing, we've tried hybrid, we've tried this stuff's covered by this vendor and I'm going to try and do this here. And I think what it comes down to is that there's certain stuff that can work that way, but the meat and potatoes has got to be internal, right? That's right. people that are most successful, right? So it's very interesting now that in 2021, um, you know, end of 2019, I don't even count 2020, but we'll talk about that <laughs> a little bit. Now we're in 2021, like, Technology at this point is starting to come down to companies that a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, they're like, no, we don't need that. We've been doing this the way this way forever, or our business doesn't is too small to require that level of technology, or um, we'll be fine doing it the old school way until we get to a certain point. And then all of a sudden, all of that went out the window, right? That's what 2020 did. Exactly. So yeah. how many, so with that in mind, like, you know, you got a bunch of customers, I'm sure, across all sorts of different verticals. What's your average size customer you're supporting? Uh, right at about 46 right now. Last okay. time we looked at it. Yeah. We'll go round up to 50, all right? Okay, That's sure. All right. So 50-person 50 50 organizations are not small. They're also not super big, right? Kind of yeah. middle of the road, right? Where they understand technology's requirement. You don't avoid it. Get ahead of it. But they also understand that, you know, they have budgeting, right? They need to understand what their costs are. They need to understand where they're going. So in 2020, a lot of people said, hey, the expenses that went out the door right away were marketing, were IT, were like, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Like the peripheral services to keep the businesses running rather than like the people who are actually making their product or service or whatever it is go. How many of your customers came to you during that time and said, let's double down on the technology so that we're ready to come out of it versus let's cut back. Was there a percentage? Um, I, I don't know that we, we looked at the percentage, but, but what we did was we didn't wait for them to come to us. We actually called every one of ours and said, look, um, if you're not on our flat rate, we need to get you there. And here's why, you know, there's a stack of tools that we use. Here's why we use this technology. It's very proactive, but for you, Mr. Time and Material, you know, client partner, it means that you're going to be able to budget this on a per user basis, you know, and, and even though they may have, they may end up going up and some of them went up in cost on some things from a, from a time and material, but they realized that they would be able to scale a lot easier by doing that. And so we had some of them do that. Uh, some of them stayed at time and materials, uh, which our time and materials from a percentage wise is only about 5%, 90%, 95% of ours is flat rate. Um, and, and so the other ones we were able to say, Hey, we're, we're jumping out in front of this. This could be, you know, and we did this very early and we did this in February and March of, of 2020. And we mm -hmm. said, look, you guys may or may not have to scale back. And when you do know, as soon as you're even thinking about it, I know that we have our normal monthly meetings or quarterly meetings, and we're usually in some sort of leadership, uh, meeting with most of our clients. So we're learning things way ahead before most of the, the their team or their employees are anyway. But I said, you need to be more diligent with us and be, you know, do this as intentional as you can. Let us know when you're going to have to scale back so that we can prep the technology side and the back side of what we need to scale back on as well. So it helped us. We we lost about 1% of business last year in 2020. I mean, in but the overall scheme of things, 1% is not 1 bad. 1% was not bad. But 
and that was total revenue, but our profit actually went up 24%. Wow. So, yeah, because we, we shifted some of those folks over, some of those that were doing not completely full stacks of our flat rate came all in on things. And so it just, it worked out better by doing that. It, it made it a little easier for us to make that conversation. The work from home piece was, you know, the big leader in all of that, you know, being able to secure that up with, I'm, I have to address this is a vast majority of our client partners have some sort of governing body over them anyway. So we are, and have always started out with a lot of regulatory business and HIPAA was one of the biggest ones. I've actually been called by the FBI twice to be a HIPAA expert witness. Uh, really? I don't ever advise. They, they just, I don't advise doing it. They just called your main number and said we need a HIPAA expert. No, they 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 already knew. Most of the time, the feds already know who the the, the tech company is that they're going after, and so um, they we got in on one that was not very friendly to our client partner. Uh, but then they realized what we did and they called us uh, a couple of times to be their expert witness afterwards. Uh, so, but I, I won't do it a third time. I, I just won't. I'm, and I was charging very good money and will not do it again. I'm not the biggest fan of, of lawyers and how, what great wordsmiths they are and how they can really trap you into saying some things. They twist it, man. They twist it. You got to it's like a chess game with these guys. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, but going back, it was, you know, it was that work from home piece and the security side of things that they did not realize was as important as it was when, you know, Sally decides that she's going to work from home and use some sort of remote control program. And then all of a sudden there are things going on at that machine that they didn't have problems with before that we were luckily able to, you know, narrow it down to that one machine and save the rest of the network Mm -hmm. but it made them realize quickly that we need to do more for that work for home than not. So let's, yeah. let's, let's do this for a second. If, and yeah. listen here as much as you're willing to, I mean, if it's proprietary, obviously don't. Um, what is like a lot, I, I, we have this, uh, I'm not going to call it argument, but maybe disagreement sometime with a lot of people, depending on where they're located. Right. People don't think they're like, Oh, uh, hundred dollars, $150, $200 per user. No, no, that's a myth. Nobody can do that. So JP, what's the average dollar amount per user you charge? 175 is our start. Our average is, is probably there. We've got some as high as $350 per user. Okay. So for those guys out there that are like, oh, I can't get past 60 bucks. And I'm like, how do you make money at 60 bucks? Like what, what's included in there? Like, you know, floss, like what, what are you putting in the bundle? So, okay. So let's talk about this then for a second. Let's unwind as much as you're willing to share. Sure. What's bundled we'll into the per user pricing from your perspective? What do you got in there? So we've got a firewall. We're, do you want me to talk vendors on this? If you want to share vendors, share vendors. There's no, there's no problem. It's up to you. Yeah. So our firewall stack is usually a sonic wall. We have some Cisco's, but so sonic wall and we use their their um, MSP, their channel solution that they have. Mm -hmm. um, we have a cloud storage solution. We don't, we haven't, we haven't mastered the uh, OneDrive side of things. And from a security perspective and the ease of it, um, it, is, it was not our first choice. And we kind of dove in big time with Ignite. So okay. we're, we are a huge Ignite user. I, I dread that bill every month, by the way, but it is damn near flawless. Um, then we have obviously the the Microsoft stack of things that are in their teams and the you know the whole Office 365. Uh, we put some what, things around. What's your, what's your base Office 365 plan? Well, we do a lot of business premium. It's probably primarily business premium. If it's not business premium, it's it's E5. Okay. And it's that simple. Uh, we are moving. We're in the works of trying to move everything over to some GCC for a, a good portion of our clients that have to have it anyway, uh, okay. that they didn't realize that they, they, didn't, they didn't need it, and now they do. Um, and we've had other discussions, obviously, on, around that side of things. So, uh, but that, that is a big, big one push that we're doing this year already. So, um, so obviously, the Office 365 things, the, around the, the email security and continuity piece, we do um, Mimecast. And yes, I did just hear that they were uh, affected by the SolarWinds stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but the mine can't, uh, drop suite. Hold on. Are you yeah. planning on changing them or are you still good? 
we're we're still good with them. We're going to be in with them for a while. That what they what has happened, I think, with them is the same thing is going to happen with a lot of people as this continues. This web continues to unwind. Um, there's a lot of people making good on that. Some of the security uh, camera solutions that we use, Verkata, also got hit bad, and they have done a remarkable job of of remediation on that piece of it. So we're we're, we're really impressed with that. Look, we're all we're all susceptible to everything. And so loyalty is a big piece and how they communicate that stuff is a big piece of things. And Mindcast has done a fairly good job so far to us. So at least we feel like they have. Um, so uh, Drop Suite's in there. Um, Iron Scales is part of the stack. Um, we have, uh, we've switched over from No Before to, um, uh, to the, um, the Mindcast piece of it. I can't remember the name of it right now and there's a few other security things in that stack and everything so i'm going to back up just a little bit more so part of that business coaching piece that we went through really helped us determine uh on paper a couple of things one who our ideal client was so we actually have an excel spreadsheet that we grade every potential client that comes in if they don't so it adds up to 2,000 points if they're anything below 17 well there's only six seven requirements in there that we have, but we, we grade everything to a 2000 point system, just make it consistent. Um, if, it, if it's anything less than uh, 1600, we are not going to press real hard. We'll stick to it or, or put a, uh, another fudge number in there of you know what the, the pain in the, the backside is going to be and uh, we'll price it accordingly. Those are some that you know are upwards of 185, 195 a user and sometimes they buy. And that's great because now we got room to go in and do a little rip and replace that they didn't necessarily budget for, but we did. So, um, so there's knowing those that client was great. They also helped us really nail down what our numbers were And that. And I think from a mentoring standpoint, those are two things that I almost always start out talking to, uh, to guys getting into this industry and say, look, you've got to know this stuff and you can't not know this stuff. Um, and, and you have to have the tools to be able to, to really track that and, and measure all of that stuff. And so the other spreadsheet of, of knowing those numbers makes it real easy, you know, knowing what your guys are from you from a soft cost hourly perspective on each client, everything. So, you know, our all in cost right now is about $67 with the amount of time based on an average amount of time that we would spend on each seat. And so it's real easy after that to realize um to add you know whatever extra numbers you need in there um that 175 is is not that far off it's really not because it just takes one ransomware to screw that for several months if you don't have enough profit in your per seat cost 100 percent yeah. do you have a little uh on the side bitcoin account just for the ransomware you wait your insurance company covers that <laughs> no i use i use tech vera for that Oh, okay. They got the, he, they got the on the side. Uh, Reese, Reese still has his ATM thing. So I call him up and say, look, I need this stuff. So <laughs> Bitcoin ATM. Yeah. Okay. That's good. I, to know. Look, share the love. The more you give, the more you will get back. I, I don't have to make all the money. 100%. No, listen. Well, okay. So back to your stack. Did we miss anything in that? Or do we pretty much cover the basic idea of what's in there? So some of the things that we are putting in there are some of the, that's, that's the basic stack. No, we've got the basic stack, but we, we do have additional things, kind of add-ons, bolt-on type stuff for those, those clients that need it or, or more of the Fed ramp CMMC stuff that we're, we're doing for them. There's, there's solutions around that, that, you know, you know, even the rapid fire tool guys are, are doing some stuff. Uh, um, I can't remember the guy's name that was here yesterday. I mean, oh, Tuesday. Compliance group. Oh, yeah, from Compliance group. That new one that is looks and is. I'm. I'm. We may be making a shift. <laughs> so, um, there's there's that kind of stuff uh, that's a bolt on. There's some training stuff that we're doing that's a bolt on um, that is very well needed. Um, so yeah, there's there's some other things in there. Awesome. So, let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. How much are you running into at 50 users? Is it realistic and is it reoccurring for you that you're going almost entirely cloud or, or how much is still on premise or how much is hybrid? Like, you know, like some people still have the feeling that 
you know, hundred uh, percent AWS or hundred percent Azure or whatever provider they choose is still not realistic. So I'm old school. So we were really slow at moving everybody off of on-prem exchanges, but, and we still have, I don't know, I think we have two or three people that, that have such old proprietary uh, uh, line of business applications that they have to have, uh, but we don't, we don't do that. So, but I tell you that to say that part of our mentality is, is that we don't want to just do cloud. We want to find out if there's a way to do a hybrid and, and not, you know, notwithstanding the political piece about what I'm going to say is that there's a realistic piece of, you said Azure and, and AWS, our standard question for a while now, before the whole parlor thing happened is, are you able to move your solution, your cloud provided solution, your software as a service solution from one platform to another platform with ease? And how long does it take you to do that? Mm-hmm. They're like, what, why do you care? And I was, well, I care because if, if you are getting, if you're all in this Azure or this AWS stack of tools to as, as a software developer to build this solution for your uh, your clients or the client that we are now representing as, as the CTO, CIO now, then that's a problem. And here's why. What, what's going to happen if they decide they don't want to offer that anymore? Mm-hmm. That's going to be on, and that may be a major part of their workflow process that we have to start looking at possibly moving. Or I'll give you another example. We have a, a large oil and gas company as a client partner that has a very specific IoT device that is on a bunch of oil wells. That's all I'm going to say. And we're going mm-hmm. you know, to order some NDA stuff. So several oil wells and gas wells that are out there. There's a small little uh, IoT device that um, that they pick up information and it goes out to the AWS cloud. Well, the the uh, the CEO of this company said, "Hey," and went back to the developer says, "You know, this is all going to AWS right now. What what if we want to move it to Azure? I think we need to move it to Azure." And he just made the decision to move to Azure, not because of anything we said necessarily, but because he started thinking about, hey, is it movable? And so he said, we're going to move it. We're going to test this right now. Oh, hell. That caused some major problems because that software developer had used so much of AWS's tool stacks in themselves, they couldn't move it all. So they had to rebuild from scratch. Wow. I'll, I'll tell you right now that those developers that he hired to build it from scratch we're using tools and, and stuff that could be moved both ways. That circles back around to the whole parlor situation. What's going to say in, you know, two more years that some other issue, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to address cancel culture for a second, some other issue like cancel culture comes up and your employee or somebody's employee does that. And now all of a sudden, the platform providers, oh, we, we can't have you on our, our, our platform anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, and now all of a sudden you have to move it anyway. So, and I think I posed this to Matt Lee, uh, this question was, are we looking at possibly a paradigm shift of moving things back to an on-prem um, uh, and not just a hybrid, but an actual on-prem uh, infrastructure? I don't know. It's a good wow. question to ask, you know? Very good question to ask. So, Especially like, you know, in your particular case, you say you have customers that fit into the government realm of things, right? They're supplying mm-hmm. government agencies, they're supplying yep. military, what Department of Defense, whatever it is, right? You know, well, uh, as long as you're in the uh, what is it, the uh, GSA, you know, if once you're yeah. in the GSA, you can kind of go to a bunch of, bunch of different places. Right. I mean, all all of a sudden, the strings start coming attached to all of that conversation, right? Regardless of which side you're on, right? Exactly. So at the end of the day, you know, portability is super important. And I'm going to say that a lot of people haven't asked that question. I'm going to, I'm going to to say that if your customer CEO was a customer of every other guy out there, there's a lot of people who are going to be in a bad spot because it's not portable. Exactly. But again, all we're doing is adding another lever that somebody has to to start. Okay. What's my risk? What's the cost of this? And, And they're just adding a different place for them to move that on anyway. But it, it's a question that has to be asked. And, and it's a question that your, your CEOs and your CFOs and your leadership teams of these companies, your client partners, need to start looking at because who knew there was going to be a pandemic? You know, nope. they, they wow. were thinking that we don't need to work from home. All right, we want our employees to, to be able to do this and that or whatever. The case. Now look at it. 
uh, what was it? Was it Ford or, or, or somebody uh, yesterday said, hey, we're going to start allowing everybody to work from home if that's what they want to do. We're not going to worry about coming back. I think that that's a different conversation anyway that we don't necessarily have to get into. But that in and of itself, in talking with CEOs, there are in HR departments, there's going to be a, a new a new type of management, I think, that's going to come out of this whole deal. You know, you're, you're going to it's just like giving them the option of a Microsoft machine versus a, a Mac machine and that ability to be able to use either one from an HR marketing perspective. That's appealing to, you know, to certain people. So is that ability to work from home or work in in person. And both of them take different types of management style to manage those people. It's true. It, I, I have personally seen the people who are great, man, you know, great in person, you know, great functionally that way. And then are not good managing remote people. It's just a different, you're right. It's a different skill set, yeah. One that maybe can be learned, but definitely is not automatic. Let me ask you this. I mean, you know, it seems like a good, you know, you had a decent amount of people, you know, in the office now from what I, when, what I saw the other day. Um, it seems like the people who, who have figured out a way to start to rotate people back to like recreate the office environment, it's a different feel. I mean, it really is. It's almost like people have to relearn how to get back into a social setting because they've been in the cave for so long. I don't think that you can group it all into to one thing. I know the pandemic has has affected different parts of this country differently. In Texas, I know we're kind of rebels as it is, and and we've done things a little bit different, like our you know like Florida and some other folks. Um, our team got really worried. And I know part of this also comes from how your leadership style is and the culture in your company. Obviously with you, you know, if you hit the F1 key on the keyboard, most any application, you get the help screen. So our culture is literally about helping each other. You know, I told you about what, what I was telling Matt early on, let's, let's put this thing together. Let's help some people get into this business and then help small and medium business. That's our that's our whole mission statement is to empower tech minded people to gain knowledge and experience, the helping part, and then to use that to help small and medium businesses grow, which is still helping. Internally, it's the one thing we preach to everybody is you help each other and you help the clients and you help our vendors. All three of them, are cool. you don't treat any of them any differently than you would treat the other. And we're not going to do the same thing. You guys are not any more important than the vendors that are supporting us or the clients that are paying our checks. And so that's a big, big culture piece. Because of that, when, from a leadership perspective, it's it was it was difficult to watch. You know, we've got a varying of ages of 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 our team here, and it was it was very hard to keep them not so worried about this pandemic. But finally, in I think it was April, uh, maybe May, they were like, "Hey, you know, we we really we really think we should be working from home." And we were like. Go work from home. We're going to do this for a while. You know, and we just made the decision to do it. There was enough of them that we could tell just from some of the things they were saying that, you know, work from home. Um, and we have a big open space. So everybody's close and around each other. And so they work from home, you know, and they did that for about a month. And we said, okay, about a month and a half went by. We said, look, we, we really feel like this is, this is, it is, is definitely something to worry about you guys. We sure do feel like we got better, uh, better camaraderie out of everything. Let's just have an in, in-house meeting, uh, you know, our normal weekly meeting that we have. Everybody came in, everybody did it. We did it safely. We masked up. We, we did the whole thing. And, and um, I told everybody at the end of that meeting, I said, look, does everybody want to come back to, to the office to work or do you still want to work from home? All, they all said, let's just work. Let's work in the office. We're not, we're not worried about it. And did we, that kind of freaked Matt and I out a little bit. We're like, okay, What's going to happen? You know, how's that going to work? And, and did we, did our guys, I'm just being open and honest, five of our guys ended up catching it. Um, they all got through it just fine. One of them was hospitalized for a little bit, but he came back and was like, no, it's fine. You know, didn't, you know, he knew what he was getting into. He made his own choice. And after that, you know, it's, it's been great around here. They I mean, they love helping each other and that's part of it. No, it's, that's, Everybody's story is different, but I'm, I'm glad that people are yeah. sharing that, right? I mean, like, yeah. you know, give people a little bit of a choice, let them decide what's best for them, make it work for the business, win-win yeah. in the end, however you come up to your end game, right? So yeah. so let's take the last part of the call here and, I don't know, think about the future for a second, right? 
Let's let's yeah. talk about what you think is going to come down the line. What you feel is the next thing that's coming. What what you're hearing through the different you know kind of you know bubbles of communities that we all talk to. Like, what's the you know think about the next? Uh, let's do two to five years, right? Let's not get too crazy, right? We'll end up being <laughs> Star Trek land. Uh, but with the next two to five years, where is technology going to? You know, how is technology going to morph? MSPs, like, is it this, you know, is it going to be diametrically different? Is it going to be relatively the same? Is it 50, 50? Like, what do you feel? What do you feel is coming down the pipe? I think probably in the next few months, we're going to see the uprise of the zombies and we're all going to be staying at home and doing, I was kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Couldn't help. Um, Couldn't help. help. Uh, it's all good. Man. In, in seriousness. Um, I really feel like that the security side of things is probably going to be the next big deal. And, and, and when I say the big deal, I mean, because we're not only the MSPs looking to self-regulate, you know, similar to what you, your CPAs did, you know, back in the day before the bar, you know, the bar for lawyers was the same way, you know, they self-regulated before all that. I think your MSPs get that way. So mentoring is going to be even more of a, a needed thing as we try to get in, in weed. I don't want to say weed out to get the folks that are more, that are really truly interested in in our industry um, is going to be a big big deal and, and I think CMMC is going to be the 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 is what's going to guide and, and drive that train obviously um, but I think that the security side of things and how we deal with this and being that advocate for technology in general and how to, um, how to be that real CTO, CIO for our client partners. I think that's going to take the biggest role ever. And honestly, George, I think this is working a little bit backwards where we're going to really become more of consultants like we were back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. You know, when people didn't want to necessarily pay for a whole lot of things, but they needed us to at least tell them what needed to happen. I think we need to get more involved in our our, our techs, if you will. Our teams need to they all need to become that sales type person advocate for technology and the stack, not just the individual things that they think are cool, but they've got to have a much broader idea of how the, the, the technology is helping a company grow. And I think that's going to be the next thing for MSPs is it's all about helping other companies grow and, and how they're going to safely use technology. You know, don't necessarily put that Nest thermostat on the wall of your office. And here's why, you know, those type of things. So it sounds like fear mongering, but it's not. You're 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 educating. Okay, so definitely security. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. I mean, if it's not just from what you're offering your customer, it's to try and keep them out of the headlines when the next few drops. Yep. Um, nobody wants to be that guy. Um, compliance, right? You said, hey, you know, so a lot of these people in regulated industries, some of these industries like CMMC, you brought up it's like a self audit, right? You're supposed to like go through the paperwork, do the math and then say, Hey, we did a checkbox, but that won't be that way forever. At some point, somebody's going to have to come and double check your homework. Right. Well, and they are, you know, the, the CMC, uh, CMMC governing body is, is actually starting to, to do that already. The assessors, I know we're out, you know, several months from what they were supposed to get started, but you're actually going to get those certifications. And my belief is within those next couple these next couple of years, that the CMMC is going to be the United States version of the EU's GDPR. Mm-hmm. And, and, I've, and I've believed that for a very long time now, especially after reading through a lot of the GDPR stuff and talking to a lot of industry experts and stuff. And I, I think that that's what's going to happen. So your Hallmark shops, your, everybody's going to have to have some level of one through five. And who knows, they may make some additional ones in there somewhere uh, that they're going to have to abide by that. It just not just to keep the data safe, but to, to the access of the data in, in any form or fashion. So, you know, you've got, you know, more Halo and Google Glasses stuff fixing to start coming out. And there's a, there's a lot to the security side of things that could keep us in business for the next decade easily. Wow. So listen up, guys. If you're not heavily going down the security line, now's the time to start looking. So, but on that topic, you can't do everything by yourself, right? There's a lot. We're hearing all the acronyms, right? EDR, MDR, SOC, SEAM, log analyzers, uh, log aggregators, uh, you know, a single sign on. And then you get into OpenID and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's like a whole new realm of 
understanding that's required outside of the typical Microsoft stack, outside of the typical stuff we've been doing for the last, you know, 30 years. Right. So definitely, definitely worth looking down that path. What, what do you think about, um, you know, do you see the cell, like the cell phone and the computer merging into a single device, or do you still see the devices separate five years from now? Oh, I, I think that we will see sooner than later, the, the, the things back, my dad read a, a magazine, the, the uh, popular science, I think it was back in the seventies. And he read a, a uh, an article that he was reading out loud to me that said that, you know, we're going to have these necklaces or these, these things that go on our ears that are going to be our, our personal managers. That's going to listen into everything that we're saying. They'll, they'll hear you and I saying, Hey, let's get together for lunch tomorrow. And it's yeah. And all of a sudden it's on our calendar and stuff like that. Uh, I think that 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 merger is is coming sooner than not, um, and you know that's my prediction to that piece of it is, uh, yes, I think that stuff's going to merge. I think it's it, the vast majority of it's going to be on. I think we've already given up that liberty to a certain extent of of having the the privacy. I don't know how to say this without getting myself in trouble. I think we've given up a little bit of liberty to too much liberty that is going to allow our privacy to be completely private like it used to be you know yeah. you can't you if i turn this off you can't necessarily you know back in the 70s you can't necessarily know what's going on in my office i, I think that's going away and and part of that is for convenience and yeah. that's where i think that that another another sliding scale want to give up convenience you know for for other things and i think we've we've pushed that a little too far um but I think it's all going to be good. I think there's going to be an equalizer some sometime in the near future as well on that. Yeah. Privacy is a big word for sure. Yeah. But I mean, the Amazon Alexas and the Google homes and the Apple version of that. Yeah. yeah I think we're kind of there. Like you said, um, where do you think the whole car thing goes? Right. I mean, like <laughs> night rider, night riders kind of come true. I mean, Kit's not talking to me, but the car is driving by itself almost. Uh, between so, that, and between human-sized drones, like is transportation's going to change, right? My my prediction has been the same for almost two years now. Is that I really think the electronic vehicle industry is going to shift away from from you know the four wheels on the ground to to drones. I I think it's one of the last major industry things that is still two dimensional. You know, we obviously we have airplanes for travel and stuff like that, but that's few. On um, very specific reasons that we do it, right? It's not an everyday. Hey, I'm going here. I'm going there. I'm going to visit who in this. You know, hop in the car and go do this thing. I think that with Uber and with uh, drones as they are today, I think that's what we're going to see. Is we're we're going to skip the whole electronic four wheel vehicle thing, auto auto-t- autonomous stuff, and we're going to go straight into drones. That nobody will ever own a drone. I think we're going to you know, order it, it'll come pick us up, take us where we want to go. Fact, we know what to, the, what's going to hit us. It's going to speed everything up even more wow. than we're sped up right now. Wow. I thought I was going to get my Amazon delivery by drone. You're saying everybody's going to move by drone. That's a big yep. difference. Yep. I okay. think it's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to write that one down. I'm going to come back to you in five years to see if you're right. All right. Yeah. All good. Um, do you, um, you know, big picture, zoom out. If you, you know, looking at your business, right? Yep. And and the industry around us. Do you agree with the talking heads that, hey, anyone who's already had an MSP has an MSP and it's just going to consolidate from here on out? Or is your position the other way, which is psh, there's so much business out there, we barely scratched the surface and there's a whole iceberg underneath at that top. And, you know, there's a lot of runway in front of us. Where, where What's your vision? It's probably a little bit in between that. And, and I think that um, I think Capitalism in general over the, the centuries has has worked and it works its way out one way or another. I think we're still early ages uh, of a lot of people consolidating and getting there. Um, I don't necessarily think it's all for the right reasons. I think there are some greedy people. Um, and I think that that is going to show um, just as it does with like, I'll use Walmart as an example. You know, Walmart is is notorious for going into small towns here in Texas and opening up a, a Walmart and putting all the small people out of business. And then uh, all of a sudden they don't have the business and they leave and 
there's a void that needs to be filled. And then those people are so loyal to those small businesses that no big business would ever think about coming in there again, you know? Uh, and I think we're going to see that in the, in the technology world, the MSP specifically, I think we're going to still see some consolidation. And I think there's that those that are consolidating or those that I think are going to be wiser are going to say, Hey, I think I'm at the size that I need to stay at right now to maintain exactly what I did to get to this point. And those guys are going to be the, you know, the Dickies, the Coca-Colas of the world that are, are sticking to a particular path and being very intentional in what they're doing. And, um, and I think that the small guys are still going like us are still going to maintain their loyalty and maintain, um, innovation. I mean, I think a lot of what we do is innovating on some of the things that we bring up. I mean, you've been on some of those calls that we're in on, especially on the security side of things that we're, we're addressing things that isn't even getting talked about sometimes, you know, and I think the big guys will eventually hear it and they do, and they'll, they'll help us achieve it. Very interesting. See, yeah, it's, it's why it's always important to get the view from where everybody's sitting, right? You know, yeah. different ideas, different surrounding area, different thought on the world. And then, you know, sometimes it all kind of comes together. JP, if somebody's looking to ask for a little bit of mentoring, where can they find you? F1IT.com. Okay. Look, look him up on his website, maybe a little LinkedIn, but sounds like JP's willing to talk to anybody who's looking mm -hmm. for a little help. And I think that that's, you know, if he's extending that out there, by all means, guys. If Drop anything I've said is wrong or debatable, by all means, I'm willing to listen and change. We can pivot just as easy as we can help people pivot. Fantastic. Appreciate, let's, once again, double thank you for, you know, channel strong parking lot usage. <laughs> we, we appreciate you and your team for letting us borrow your space. Um, love having you guys here, man. I always love seeing you guys. Uh, we're we're going to try and keep that going. And then, um, you know, you know, really appreciate you giving us a little bit of, you know, view from your world. And I really think that the more of these conversations that happen, the better off we all are. Cause like it's a community aspect, right? Yes. The more we do of that, the better off everyone is. I really appreciate you for hopping on everyone. Everyone, this session was recorded as well as every other session we've ever done. You can find that at the same place that we mentioned in the beginning of this MSP initiative.com you can go to sessions and you'll be able to rewind fast forward and pause if you need to. Uh, keep, keep back, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, one o'clock Eastern time. So when we do them live, definitely continue to keep joining us and we'll continue to bring really smart people in to talk about what's happening in the world. JP, I'll, uh, touch base to you soon, buddy. George, thanks for everything that you and your whole team do. Uh, you guys are, keep this up. This is good stuff. I learned something every time I watch you guys. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you for hopping on and talk soon. Bye yes, everybody. Sir. See y'all.